Welcome back to Mr. Scare. For today's episode, I have a compilation of scary truck driving horror stories. But before I begin reading, I want you to smash the like button and subscribe to Mr. Scare for regular horror podcasts. I was driving my truck across the state highway in the middle of the night. It was deserted, but it was not much surprising to me. Since I had traveled through this route on a couple of occasions, I knew that it usually gets lonely at night. Anyway, it does not matter much to me, since it is barely a four hour long drive. So I was driving as usual. However, there was one thing a little out of the ordinary. I saw a man ask for a lift. He was a hitchhiker, and I have a strict self-decided policy toward hitchhikers, I never stop for them. And I do feel guilty about it, but I prefer to not put myself at risk. So I saw this man stand at the corner turn, asking for a lift. He didn't say much. I was driving downhill and the road was curvy. I saw him at the first turn and just noticed him. He had his hand out, but I did not see it at first. I continued driving along the curve. Now the road was actually a zigzag downhill. So I knew I could see him again once I drive my truck past it. I kept an eye on him because I had to see him stand on the elevated ground. But he was not there. To my surprise, he was on my level. He had probably jumped a level down and reached the side of my road. His sudden appearance had caught me off guard, and so I was noticing his actions or movements. If he was so quick in jumping or making his way down the elevated ground, he could have easily pounced on my truck and climbed on it. But he didn't. As I moved past him, he just stood there, with his hand stretched out. But I didn't stop. I kept driving at the same speed, or maybe slightly faster. I shrugged it off and continued on my path. As my truck made a turn around the corner, I noticed that I was going to cross the same path again, on lower ground. You see, I was still making my way downhill. I kept a close eye on the spot where I last saw him, but he was not there. I quickly looked under the same spot, assuming he again made his way down the slope and waited at the side, but he was not there. In fact, he was not visible anywhere. I relaxed and continued on my path. The idea of the stranger asking for a ride made me uncomfortable, especially considering how he never spoke a word. He just put his hand out and stood like an emotionless statue. I decided to move on since I was almost more than halfway downhill. And it was almost impossible for him to show up now, especially knowing that he was not seen for the last few minutes, despite the road that went through the same hill. I resumed the music and decided to move on. I was on a notoriously accident-prone route, and it was dark. My priority should be to keep an eye on the road, and not for the creepy hitchhiker dude. The road was bumpy, so I drove slowly for the next few minutes. The last thing I wanted at that moment was to not have a punctured tire. So I kept driving as safely and slowly as possible. As I made the turn around the curve, I saw the man again. He was standing on the side of the road. As usual, he had his hand stretched out. Not a single expression over his face. I was paranoid. It was impossible that he had made his way downhill in such a short time, and that too with ease. He was not even panting. I accelerated along the curve and zoomed past him. He did not say a word. I looked back to see what he did after my truck passed. I wanted to know if he immediately rushes downhill. But to my surprise, he was not there. He was missing. I gasped realizing that the road was empty as if he never stood there asking for the ride. I faced ahead to see the road, and I saw him stand right ahead of my truck. And before I could apply my brakes, my truck dashed into him, and he landed with a loud thump on the floor behind. I was scared to the core. But I did not stop. I decided to keep driving, and I did. For the next few miles, I pressed the gas and went on at the maximum possible speed that I could go on over the terrain. Later, I saw a patrolling car. I parked beside him and approached the patrolling officer. After narrating the entire incident to him, he plainly looked at me and asked me to ignore it. I was stunned. I mean I had just crashed and hit a man on the road. 
and he did not care about it. He later explained that I was not the only one. Many drivers had experienced the same thing. The main positive thing that I did was that I did not stop to give him a ride. He claimed that the entity I encountered was not a human. It was a trickster. A trickster who has tricked and led many unwary travelers crashing downhill. The road was not much dangerous, but the trickster was indeed. I was on a road trip with my buddies. My dad's truck was available, and so we hopped onto it for an adventure. It was summertime, and we had planned to hit the road. Now I am not a fan of night drives, but the idea of driving on the highway, and that too in the middle of the night, is a little exciting. Yes. I was well aware of the risks. Apart from the fact that it is always dangerous to drive at night, there is always an additional risk of criminals or animals lurking around. The highway that we were on was not much busy that night. So we were driving casually and partying too. We were drinking and screaming while driving. But again, the highway was empty and we were not disturbing anybody. Amidst the loud music, suddenly we heard a loud thumping sound and the noise from the truck's engine stopped out of nowhere. We drove to the side as the engine slowly came to a still. Out of all possibilities that could go wrong, the truck had decided to break down. That too in the middle of a highway. The five of us got off the truck and waited for the call to connect. But the network was so poor that none of us was getting any reception on our devices. Two of my friends tried to figure out the issue, but to no avail. And that is when the real trouble began. A car approached us and slowed down. We told him about the problem, and he offered help. He said he wouldn't risk getting off his car. So we trusted him. No sane man would stop his car in the middle of the highway for anyone else. He offered a ride to the nearest gas station. We could find some help there. So one of my friends got inside the car and he drove off. We had our doubts, but we waited for him to return. About 15 minutes later, we got restless because there were no signs of him. I opined that the four of us could walk in the direction of the gas station. But we couldn't leave my dad's vehicle alone. He was supposed to drive it to work a day later. I know it sounds dumb, but we decided to split up. Two of us stayed back, while the other two walked toward the station. As we stayed back, I sensed that we had taken a risky decision. But now it was too late. We were alone in the middle of a highway. There was a forest on one side and barren land on the other. After waiting for over another 15 minutes, we started to panic. I could also hear an occasional sound coming from the woods. It was the sound of some movement along with the trees. My friend Phil panicked too. We knew that if it was a creature in the woods, we could not even outrun it. So we rushed inside the truck and locked the doors. The lights were already out. So we kept looking for anything moving nearby. As we saw a bobcat make its way, we froze in our spots. Its green eyes could scare off anyone. We were in the truck, so we were not in that big of a danger. But if the bobcat spots us, then we might get in trouble. We were already panting with less air inside the powerless vehicle. The bobcat loitered on the highway and kept looking around. I slipped a little low, so that only my eyes and forehead could be visible to the bobcat. Phil had not moved for the last five minutes. He kept updating me about its position despite knowing that I was watching it. His brain had shut down. He screamed and panicked as his eyes met the bobcat's eyes. It changed its demeanor. It started walking toward us and we did not know what to do. We stayed put inside. We knew it would be difficult for it to break the glass. As it pushed its face into the window, Phil slammed the glass. The curious bobcat was now irritated and infuriated. It had taken it as a challenge. The bobcat kept scratching the glass, but to no avail. We let out a sigh of relief and even joked about it. Phil went a step further and teased it from inside. Suddenly, the bobcat leaped above us and stood on the roof. We could sense a dent forming on the top. The roof of this semi-old truck was not strong enough to sustain its weight. We were really scared. We did not know what to do. 
we decided to stay calm. Phil tried to bang the roof from the inside to scare off the bobcat. But it didn't budge. It stayed up. In fact, it peeped above the window from the opposite side. It knew that we were trapped inside. Phil panicked as the bobcat gave a strong blow to the window. We thought it broke, but it didn't. But yes, there was a crack. A big crack. This only meant one thing. The window could sustain one, or at most two such blows. Then it would break. The bobcat attacked again and some parts of the glass chipped off. Phil panicked and dashed outside on the highway. The bobcat took a moment to understand what was happening. It leaped toward philosophy. I opened my door and threw a can at it. I knew it made no sense, but I was trying to buy Phil some time. There was no way that he was going to outrun a wild animal in a chase. The bobcat hissed at me but turned and moved toward philosophy. He kept running and closed his eyes as a bright light zoomed towards him. The bobcat too stopped in its track and escaped into the woods. It took a moment to see that the headlights were of a car that our friends were returning from. They were back, after almost an hour. And had they not reached on time, Phil would have not survived at all. And on a side note, I am never going to drive at night across a highway. And if I ever have to, I am never going to let us split up. If I remember correctly, I was somewhere in Missouri when this happened. I had driven my truck for six or seven hours at a stretch, and I needed a short break. So I stopped at an off-ramp to stretch out and take a breather. As I pulled out and started smoking a cigarette, a little girl from some direction I couldn't figure out giggled loudly and said, Hi, sir. I was stunned by her sudden sound and appearance. My initial reaction was what the hell is a little kid doing out here at this time? This was mainly because it was about to get dark soon. And there were no houses visible nearby. I looked around to spot any cars parked, but there were none. So I tried to figure that out first. I talked back to her and said hi. She then responded to my hi with. My mom says that you will be okay. So you don't have to worry. Now I was utterly confused and puzzled by what the little girl had just said. I asked her what she meant by what she just said. But I got no response from her. She just stood there, looking at me and not moving a lip. Then all of a sudden, I feel like somebody was standing next to me, but it did not feel negative or bad at all. It just felt like somebody was present right there, standing next to me. I could sense what was going on, but I did not panic. Plus. Being a trucker, I had been in such situations before. Since it didn't have a negative vibe to it, I just finished my cigarette at my regular pace, and then got into my truck, and left the place. Later when I was down the road, I realized that I had forgotten to fuel up at my last stop, when the warning light came on. So I scrambled to look at my GPS, and searched for the nearest truck stop. I found one and set the course. As I rolled up to the truck stop, my truck started sputtering, and I barely made it to the fuel line, before the truck started to die. I ran out of fuel right as I got on the fuel line. It wasn't until I was fueling up, that it occurred to me what the hell happened at my last stop. A chill ran down my spine as I realized. It was probably the spirit of the mother that told the little kid, who was a spirit too I suppose, that my fuel tank was about to be empty. But that I would be okay okay enough to make it to the next gas station. And she was right. It is experiences like these that actually make you rethink the possibilities of this world. I mean I have seen creatures and things in the sky. Those stories can be made up by anyone. But this, it hits differently. Thank you, little kid and her mother. I hope you two rest in peace. As a seasoned trucker, I've seen truck drivers duke it out so many times, while waiting for their turn in the fuel line. I have also seen brawls happen in the back of truck stops. Not only that, but I have also seen many rookies hitting other trucks by accident. I mean you name it, and I've seen it all. The most memorable fight that I had ever seen, was when I was on a trip with a co-driver whom we shall say, our partnership fell apart really fast on the way home. 
In Arizona, I stop at a truck stop between Flagstaff and the California state line. After an eternity, I finally decided to pull up on the fuel line. I fuel up and go inside to take a shit and get something to drink and snack on. I come back and the sleeper curtain is open, no co-driver. 30 to 45 minutes go by and he comes out. That's cool, take your time because I ain't stopping from here on out. Get it all out now. I put some trash in a couple of bags and put it on the floor, it was mostly his trash from his shift prior that I couldn't stand having in the cabin anymore. He opens the door and dumps the bags on the ground. So I lit his butt up with all the fury that I could muster up. Two garbage cans 20 feet away. Holy shit no! I go put the bags in the trash cans and come back to the truck. As I'm doing my logbook, I look up and glance at my mirror. I see two drivers flapping wings at each other getting into a fist fight. Oh good a fight, let's watch. Sorry, but I enjoy watching some action drama. Suddenly they go at it like baboons. Fists flying, but they're not landing any hits. Then one of the drivers picks up the trash cans and throws it at the other driver that can hit him square in the face and blows open with paper towels going all over the place. WWE just rolled into town apparently. So I got out and started walking back to watch, and apparently, every other driver on the fuel line had the same idea. The driver who got trash canned reached into the storage compartment in his truck and pulls out a huge chain with a big-ass padlock on it. He swung it furiously as he was coming back to the front of the truck where the trash canner is. Mr. Chain Gang takes out the pump, takes out his driver's side window, knocks the mirror off his truck, puts a huge gouge in his fender, and then makes it to the trash canner. The guy runs around the other side of the fuel pump, grabs the squeegee, and starts beating Chain Gang with it. All it does is get the guy wet, and piss him off more. So now it's a battle of melee weapons. Enough time rolls by that they realize neither weapon of choice is doing any good, so in an epic sequence of moves, they bear hug the living fuck out of each other, and flop to the ground, and start bicycling each other. I walk inside and tell the lady that there's a fight on the fuel line, and she bolts out the door and breaks them up, like a chaperone breaking up two kids fighting on the playground. All this because supposedly Chain Gang said some shit to Trash Canner's wife. His argument was that he didn't do shit, she just walked up and started picking a fight. I believe the chain gunner more than the trash can guy. But why do I care? I had seen some Netflix level drama before my shift. When it comes to my scariest truck driving memory, I'm always reminded of the last time I was driving to New Mexico. That day, I was coming from Colorado to New Mexico. It was a long day, and after driving for over four long hours, I generally take a short break to loosen up. I parked on the side, took a piss, and stretched all my muscles. I had specifically stopped at an off-ramp, mainly to shut down for some sleep. At first, I had some trouble falling asleep. It had to do with the risks that I was putting myself into. I had heard so many accounts of my fellow drivers, where they had stopped at such random spots and then woken up to being attacked by some animal, or burglars, or some creepy unexplainable phenomenon. But I really needed some rest. And a quick short one to be honest. I was not planning on sleeping for hours. All I needed was a power nap. So I set alarm for 15 minutes and dozed off. Before sleeping, I did make sure that the windows were closed and the doors were locked tight. Maybe it was the fatigue, but I slipped into sleep in a jiffy. Not sure how long had passed, but when I opened my eyes, it was getting a little dark. More importantly, I woke up to a car pulling up behind me and turning off its lights. I started getting this really eerie feeling that I needed to get the hell out of Dodge. I decided to not make any panic-stricken movements. I did not want to alarm them at all. So I stayed put in my position. I kept a close eye on the movements of the car behind me. Not the car of course but the driver inside. But for some reason or the other, I could not see anyone around. The windshield was a darker tint so I couldn't see if anyone was inside. But never mind. I did not care as long as no one moved out with a weapon or something. 
After a couple of minutes, I leaped into the driver's seat, started the truck, and started hauling it onto the highway. As I was taking off, I looked into the driver's side mirror and saw that somebody was standing by the side of the trailer. It was in the blind spot so I couldn't spot him before. My chicken lights were the only way I was able to see him. I chugged on down to the rest area about 15 miles down the road. And I decided that I will never stop on random points again. My story was nothing as compared to what others have been through. And maybe if I would have not woken up in time, the man would have attacked me or stolen something from the trailer. Just never stop. Just so you know, I spent more than 8 years in the military, and I have been a tattoo artist for 11 years now. In my travels, I have met and tattooed well over 5,000 people, and for anyone who doesn't get tattooed, it is kind of like therapy. People get them for all different reasons, but the common theme is that people like to talk. I try to have friendly conversations with all of my clients, but if anything sounds too crazy, I tend to just nod my head and carry on with the tattoo. Now that the basics are covered, I will never forget these two particular clients I had while tattooing in southern Arizona. Two truckers with two ridiculous sounding conspiracy theories that I may or may not fully believe. But these got me listening. The most fascinating two clients, with the coolest stories though, were these two truckers. I tattooed them every time they were in town. The first, let's call him Jim, said he worked for a government-contracted shipping company, and all his work entailed was driving cargo into the mountains, driving past military checkpoints, into a circular door cut into the mountain, and dropping the cargo off into a staging area tall enough to park a small skyscraper. Jim said he saw huge tunnels leading off of this chamber, and trucks coming and going with cargo, but his clearance led him into the staging area to unload and then leave, no more. So needless to say, I was a little skeptical. Like yeah, I worked for the Alphabet Soup and know all about some of the mountain retreats and missile silos, but really, underground highways? Staging areas you can walk a mecca through? Quit pulling my chain. That was until about two or three months later, when I met Bill. Bill said he was a trucker, and when I asked what he carried, he said all the secret cargo. I asked him, so like all the covered stuff you see on the highway. And his reply was just. No, the stuff is too dangerous, or of the books that you never see on the highway. Since the thoughts of Jim's stories were still in my mind, I asked if he meant the underground highway, and Bill lit up like crazy. Like he was tired of having his work discounted. He went off for the entire session about the crazy weapons and biohazard shit he hauled around on the Great American Underground Highway. As Bill explained it, and corroborated Jim's story, the underground drivers are different from the above ground, so as to maintain separation and levels of secrecy. All the doors are guarded by black op types, and the scale is simply off the charts. He said that the entire nation was connected underground via these tunnels, but only near major cities, were there any access points, and those were usually hidden in the mountains just thousands of miles of giant tunnels deep underground being driven solely by government contract truckers, hauling ultra-sensitive gear. I don't know how true these stories are, because I have never seen them, nor can I provide any proof. But two strangers sharing a similar story definitely makes your mind stop and pause. I used to deliver freight across the Great Plains in the Minnesota area. One night around 2 a.m. I was hauling across North Dakota trying to reach Montana by morning. I was delivering a particularly valuable tractor part that a farm desperately needed for the following day. I began to notice some highway hypnosis sneaking up on me, but it didn't really bother me because I had been through it hundreds of times before. Anyone who has driven across North Dakota knows that it is incredibly flat. Like, really flat there also tend to be very straight and long roads. It's somewhat easy to see things on the road that are far away, even at night. I noticed something long on the road, spanning my entire lane, approximately half a mile in front of me. I slowed down a little and prepared to move into the opposite lane, thinking it was some retread off a blown tire. As I got closer I noticed it was two people, laying head to toe across the entire lane. 
I swerved into the other lane, successfully avoiding them, and came to an almost complete stop. But they didn't move. Not an inch. I was just about to back up and check on them, when I remembered a story that an old greybeard colleague of mine told me. He told me that in certain remote areas, people will lie down in the middle of the road and wait for a car or truck to stop and see what's going on. At that point, the person laying on the road, along with whoever else is hiding in the nearby bushes, will beat the shit out of the driver and steal his vehicle, leaving him in the middle of nowhere. I decided not to back up, and when the two people on the road saw me put my truck back in gear and drive away, they both got up and walked toward the shoulder of my truck. And as I panicked and sped up a little, two men appeared in the front of my truck and threw something on my windshield. I didn't bother to notice what it was but it splashed on my screen, and it looked like an egg. The raw egg was splashed on my windscreen. Maybe it was my adrenaline after their failure, and presumably stupid attempt to try to break my truck's glass with an egg, that I heckled them as I toggled my wipers. I could feel my soul leave my body as the wiper did not clear it up. Instead, the egg's fluid formed a foam over the glass. And now I could not see anything ahead. And I am not exaggerating. There was a white and pale yellowish smudge all over the view. Naturally, I slowed down to not risk running over someone or going off the trail. That's when a rock smashed through the passenger seat window and tumbled on my lap. Now I am no Sherlock, but in that moment of panic, my brain worked like a supercomputer and I launched the stone crashing through my windshield. I don't know where it landed, but I was relieved that it had managed to make a sizable hole through which I could see the road ahead. I sped up and bumped something on the road and I did not bother to stop and check if it was one of those criminals. The shouting around me reverbed in my ear even hours later. They were cunning, but I managed to survive the situation. Always remember to never use water in a wiper if eggs have been thrown on your windshield. They will create a foam and not clear off. Later once I was back to my senses, I called the police and explained what happened. But we were so far away from civilization that I doubt anything came of it. Thanks to that old greybeard, I gotta keep my truck, my job, and my life. In 2004 or 2005 I was driving flatbed, and had picked up a load of construction material like drywall, roofing, and other similar stuff that I don't remember now. But it was prepackaged in boxes and I remember having to use strap protectors on the entire load, while driving in rural Tennessee. My memory is foggy now, but I want to say it was between Memphis and Nashville, but closer to the intersection of the Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee state lines. Tarp was required so I strapped everything down, tarped the load, and left the shipper. About five miles down the road, in the middle of nowhere within the woods on a two-lane road, I noticed my tarp flapping in the wind. I found a wide shoulder and pulled over to fix it. I realized that I had done a shitty job tarping this load, so I decided to redo it on the side of the road. I undo all the bungee straps, drag the tarps off, roll them back up, climb up on the load and start unrolling the tarps again, and I see a guy walking down the same side of the road I'm on, coming towards my truck. I don't think anything about it other than to keep an eye on him, all because I'm in the middle of nowhere, while I continue what I'm doing. About the time I have tarps set in place and am climbing down to start hooking the bungee straps back on, this dude is getting close enough that I'm now paying more attention to him than I am to tarping my load. I grab my winch bar and set it on the trailer where I'm working. So I had this 8 pound solid metal bar about 4 feet long tapered to a blunt point on one side, ready to defend myself. The guy gets to me and the first thing I notice is his hair. It's like a mullet but it's patchy as fuck. Like he tried to cut his own hair and had a seizure in the process and gave up. The next thing I noticed was his eyes, which I can only describe as off. Like they were clear, and I didn't think he was drunk or high or anything, but it also gave me the distinct impression that the elevator didn't go all the way up. His clothes were dirty and not well maintained, with dirty white tennis shoes, cause I remember he didn't have laces on one shoe, and the tongue was noticeably out of place. He stops by me, waits until I acknowledge him, and just says, I've got a long walk. I'm like, yeah man, you do, we're in the middle of nowhere. Making it clear there's no ride that I'm offering him. 
He nods, starts walking by me continues on his way, stops at about the driver's door on my truck and turns around, comes back to me, and repeats himself. I've got a long walk. At this point, I explain that I can't give him a ride, insurance, and all that. I apologize for not being able to help him out, and he seems to accept this, so turns around and leaves. I wait for him to get a little away from my truck, and then start working on finishing the tarp job. I still keep an eye on him, and I notice that he's moving away from me. As I'm putting on the last of the bungee straps, I look over to check where he's at, and he's turned around heading back towards me. He was now about 100 yards in front of my truck, and was coming back my way. It looks like he's talking on a cell phone, has his hand up to his face, and I can barely make out his mouth moving, his other hand waving like he's having a conversation with someone. I finish with the straps, grab my winch bar, and am climbing into my truck as he's about 10 yards away now. Soon as I'm in the cab I lock the doors, and set the winch bar on the passenger seat just in case. I look at the guy and realize he's not talking on a phone, he's talking to his fucking hand and now I'm nervous, cause he doesn't look like he's having a nice pleasant chat, it looks more like an angry conversation. I crank the truck up, put it in gear, and just pull out, didn't look for traffic or anything. As I pass him, he's just looking at me, still holding his hand to his face with this dead ass look on his face, just staring at me. He gave me the creeps. About the time I hit fifth gear, I look in the mirror and there was no one there. This one happened when I was hauling freight from New York to Nevada. I worked for a company that has many acronyms, and all of them are bad. The company was pretty good, but never felt like home. I always pass this ghost town on the border of New Mexico and Texas. And every time I passed through it, I got chills. I swore to never stop in that town, because the closest town was a good 50 miles away, if not more. Unfortunately, I was unlucky, as my hours for that day had me stuck right in the center of that town. I pulled into the 70s era gas station, and walked around for a bit. I thank God that I had my maglite flashlight, as it made everything bright as day. I didn't find anything but boarded up windows and a swinging door to a hole in the ground toilet. I finished up my business and thank God that I didn't need to sit down. I did my walk around and checked everything we were supposed to. A truck in tip top shape is a truck you never will be stranded in the middle of nowhere. I did this three times as my standard custom because I was nervous Nelly. I got into my truck and checked everything inside and made sure no hitchhikers came then closed all of my curtains to wind down after locking everything. I wasn't moving and my freight wasn't going to be disturbed out here. After getting about three hours of sleep, I woke up to knocking. I was slow to it, until I heard a loud thud on my driver's side door. I rushed to the driver's side, and turned my flashlight down. No one was there and no footsteps. I thought that was odd and opened the door. I looked around all over the place and saw nothing. Then I got out, grabbed my keys, and locked the door. I walked around the entire rig and noticed that I saw only and only my own shoe prints. I checked on everything and nothing was wrong. I did one more pass before I heard another loud thudding sound on the passenger side this time. I ran over there quickly, only to see that there was nothing there. I sighed to myself and prayed, as I did another pass around the rig. Maybe someone was pulling a prank and being a jerk. I didn't see anyone at all and started to panic a little. If they climbed on my rig, I was going to be pissed. I climbed into the truck after unlocking it. I said a prayer and went to bed. The next morning, I did my morning pass and noticed what looked to be animal tracks. I shrugged it off as any other animal. I said a prayer of thanks after I finished checking and swore to end my day early if I ever passed through that town again. I don't do trucking anymore. I took this decision after several problems, and now I work as a caregiver for my grandfather. I am not a truck driver by profession. But every summer from the age of eight, our family would drive a truck or a van to Mexico for vacation. My dad had fixed up an old van that allowed us to sit eight at a time. 
We would drive from Texas to Zacatecas, and my uncle from Sinaloa would meet us in Zacatecas, and drive us to Sinaloa. Well back in those days, in order to get to Sinaloa, you had to drive through the mountains. And there were parts of the road, that only had enough room for one vehicle to get by. You could literally see down the mountain, from the passenger windows in some areas. So you would have to be careful and keep an eye out for oncoming traffic. This was especially if it was a trailer or a bus. My uncle drove this road regularly since he was a bus driver. There was one particular part of the road called the Spine of the Devil. It was a small part of the road that bridged and connected two mountains. Normally there were vendors there who were local mountain people that sold food and water. It was almost like a makeshift rest area. People would get out and take pictures. You were so high up in elevation that many times you were in the clouds. On this particular trip when we drove by, there were no vendors and we didn't see anyone taking pictures. So my uncle told my dad that he didn't feel comfortable stopping if there were no locals there. My dad agreed and we kept driving. I don't know how long we drove before I suddenly felt my uncle push the brakes very rapidly. When I moved over to see through the front windshield, I could see a little white truck. There was a man with a cardboard sign that said, stop, and he was holding that while walking towards us. Dad said, what's that? And my uncle responded that they put a truck in the road. Dad asked, now what? To which my uncle asked, you want to talk to them or you want me for it? My dad immediately responded, no, we aren't taking our chances. Floor it. My uncle nodded as we drove past the guy walking. As I moved past him, he dropped the sign, banged his fist on the side mirror, and all along the van screamed, Blow it! Blow it! And then reached his hand behind him. My uncle hit the truck to get through, and the truck rolled down the side of the mountain. Then we heard a pop and a loud bang. We could see rocks falling behind us as we drove. We never really knew what was going on. But my dad and uncle were not going to take chances with six other family members in the van. The following year we took the bus from Zacatecas to Sinaloa, and ended up stranded halfway up the mountain, because one of the earlier routes had been hijacked, and they kidnapped four girls between 12 to 14 years old. This happened on a road trip with my ex-girlfriend, and I've always wanted to tell this story. We were headed to Eureka in California from Oregon, and had to go on this highway 299. We had a late start to our day, so it was nighttime by the time we set out on 299, thinking it would be just a normal stretch of a rainy highway. We were thoroughly unprepared for how twisty and isolated it was. Midnight came and it had been pouring rain, and my girlfriend was dodging rockfall for the entire drive so far, and she was absolutely drained. We found a flat place to pull over for a quick nap. It was like a little outcrop of dirt alongside the road. The rain had stopped, but it was muddy. And man was it very quiet around there. We were both so drained that we just crashed for about 30 minutes or so in our respective seats. Keep in mind, We'd been on the road for a while, and hadn't passed a single car the entire time. I woke up to the sound of scratching underneath the car, which I brushed off as an animal. Then I heard steady plopping out in the mud, like someone was circling our car, but didn't see a damn thing. I elbowed my girl thinking she was still asleep, but she was fully awake and frozen in place and just said. I know! She said she had this feeling that something was off, from the second we pulled into that spot. We held deathly still for a bit longer, still reckoning it was a deer or something. Yes, we were in denial. I got a literal wave of goosebumps when we heard that faint scratching start up yet again. This time we bolted into action, and she threw the car into reverse pretty quickly. Suddenly she screamed. There's someone there! Oh my god! As she saw a figure dive into a nearby bush, lit up by the reverse lights. I looked but didn't see anything. We both were in 100% panic mode and practically skidded back onto the road. The rest of the drive back into California was unremarkable, but we did have a motorcycle tail us for most of the way back after that. 
from a decent distance, luckily for us. But seeing that faint light bobbing far behind us gave us the creeps on top of everything. It was probably unrelated, but who knows? Everything felt creepy and wrong for the rest of the night. Be careful on Highway 299 in Oregon. Almost about six years from today, I was on a routine job of truck driving which is called as a meet and turn. In this system of work, we follow a process where a driver that is stationed in one city will drive a load halfway to its destination. At the same time, a driver that is living out of that destination will drive halfway with a load that is destined for my city. The two drivers meet in a predetermined spot which is usually a parking lot. We meet one another, switch our trailers with one another, and drive back home. I had been on this regular trucking job for a few months, and I found that I always got to the agreed meeting point, about an hour and a half before the other driver. It was a little annoying to wait almost every time. But it might have more to do with my habit of always reaching almost about half an hour early for any occasion. So if you think about it, the other dude was just half an hour late and traffic is unpredictable in the late hours. So what I started to do was utilize that time to get a power nap. Not a power nap, but an hour-long nap. It was a dark and empty dirt lot at about 2 a.m. in the middle of the night so I would stretch out across the seat and take good rest. Now this nap was also a part of my routine for a week or two. Although one night, about 10 to 15 minutes into my nap, I was awoken by a barking dog. It was loud and consistent, but I tried to ignore it. However, the non-stop barking carried on for several minutes, and got louder and louder as the dog got closer to my truck. Soon, it became apparent that the dog was right outside of my truck, barking at my window. Now I joked to myself that either that dog was Lassie, and it was trying to alert me to something, or else it is just a pain in the butt, and I will need to throw something at him to scare him off. I don't hit animals but he was barking non-stop. So I wouldn't mind shooing him away. It is important to note that the barking had been going on for a good 15 minutes at this point. So, I sat up and looked out my window. Standing there, mere inches on the other side of the glass, was a man of about 35 to 40 years of age. He was a large dude. And he was barking at me. His eyes were outright crazy, and he was frothing at the mouth a little. I mean I remember taking a good look at it. In fact, my brain was almost reset upon seeing a human standing, where I expected a dog to be. The scene really held my full attention for a moment. Then when I realized what was happening, the sheer creepiness of this encounter struck me. Gently, and making an absolute minimum of sudden movements, I reached down and started my truck. And I pulled away as slowly as possible. He chased me, much like you might expect an angry dog to do, barking all the while. Needless to say, it played hell with my power naps from then on. And I had to get to the main road to get rid of him. And as I was driving, I saw the other trucker coming in my direction. We had exchanged trailers for two weeks by then, and we were familiar with the trucks. So I signaled him to stop there on the side. We exchanged it there and he asked me what was wrong. While unpacking, I told him everything. I finished describing how he looked, and that's when he pointed far behind me and asked if that was what I was speaking of. I turned back and saw him staring at me from near the entrance of the truck stop. As if it was that dog's territory, and it would violate some unwritten border agreements. As the other trucker took a few steps ahead and pointed at him to take a good look, he started barking again, and charged toward us. We panicked and jumped in our respective trucks. He reached under his door and kept barking. He was a huge guy and the other dude did not want to risk getting into a fight with him. Instead, I don't know why, but he whistled gently and calmed the crazy man. And to my surprise, he actually seemed to get a little calm. He then reached for a low-lying tree branch and broke it to make it a stick. And threw it as far as he could. I shit you now, he dashed in that direction and never returned. We were creeped out to the core. And we decided to never meet at that spot ever again. And we never did. It might just be a crazy guy. But it was so damn scary to see a human bark like that. 
I hope he got the medical attention that he required, because I called the cops and informed them about it. I never followed up on the case, because I just wanted to forget about it all at once. I used to drive a car on the highway between San Francisco and Cheyenne a lot. It's about 18 to 22 hours of driving, depending on the weather and traffic, and other usual factors. Anyway, one time I got out at a truck stop to stretch my legs and relieve my bladder, and maybe buy a soda can for the remainder of my drive. I walk into the bathroom and there are huge signs drawn over the walls. At first, I didn't care much because seeing graffiti on the walls is quite common at truck stops. So I was relieving myself when I looked at it again and saw that it was in the blood. Or at least the color was realistic. And it seemed like some witchcraft symbols. It might be psychological, but I did feel like my energy was being sucked out of me. I rushed out at the earliest, feeling dizzy all the way. But somehow I made it to my car. I revved up my engine and headed for my car outside of this spot. In the rearview mirror, I could see some dark shadow watching me leave the truck stop. A second time I was driving at night, and the car suddenly started making this odd grinding noise. It sounded as if I ran over something that got stuck to the car maybe. It was about 2 or 3 a.m. in the middle of the night. The noise had started to annoy and more importantly distract me. So I pulled into a rest stop and woke up my buddy who was sleeping. I explained it to him as we got out of the car and we both heard what sounded like a kid crying. There were no other cars at the rest stop. The area was well lit so we could have seen a car if there was one. But there was no other car or truck there. We decided to shrug it off but we had frequently heard stories about child trafficking and kidnappings happening nearby so we decided to check it out. We grabbed our flashlights and headed towards the noise which was coming from the bathrooms. As we got closer, we realized that it was coming from the women's bathroom, and it was a low, dull sobbing. We are prepared for the worst. We walk in expecting to see some brutally beaten and exploited kid, and we see nothing. The sound was still there, and it was still clearly coming from the room, but the room was absolutely empty. We turned on the lights and still nothing. We checked each stall, and also the trash can. Nothing at all. We even started looking for the part of the room where the sound was coming from, but to no avail. Was it some sort of a hidden speaker? Were we lured inside? Were we on candid camera? What the hell was going on? My buddy climbed up one of the stalls to get to the top window in the rest stop which was vented out. He then closed it, and the noise paused. Completely stopped. He opened it again, and there was no more noise. We sat there for a few seconds, staring at each other. We shrugged at one another. Then the window slammed shut again, without him even touching it. I watched it happen right in front of my eyes. We were out of that damn bathroom within the next few seconds. The noise started up, about 10 seconds later as we got to the car, and we were tearing out of the parking lot within 20 more seconds. The grinding noise was still there. But it didn't bother us anymore. So the next time I pull over, a few miles later at a truck stop, that was not just well lit, but also a little occupied by other truckers. There were a couple of other truckers there, and no other civilians like us. We check under the car. There's a red and silver piece of metal wedged between the part of the car and the road, about half an inch or so off the ground, so with us in the car, it would definitely have been grinding against the ground. We couldn't remove it with our bare hands because it was really wedged in there. So we kick at it to bend it, and figure that we'll remove it when we get back. A week later I had my mechanic take it out, when he was doing a routine servicing of the car, and he told me that it was a part of a kid's tricycle. It was the red metal part, where somebody could stand. Now I don't know why, and I don't think they were connected or anything, but that was one of those moments for me which was totally messed up and crazy. I am not a truck driver, but I have a lot of truckers working for me. I was a transportation broker for many years. I had received complaints from my truck drivers about certain routes, and I always respected them. I helped them chalk out solutions to their troubles and found alternate routes that would minimize time and effort. 
I won't get into the details of those complaints, but rather focus on one interesting incident. The business was growing well, and we started expanding our area of business. One of those years, we obtained government contracts for the transfer of some undisclosed hazardous materials. I am making it up, but those were the exact words on the contract. We were under extremely strict restrictions to keep everything about these loads confidential. And that everything ranged from the trucking companies, to whom we brokered these loads, to their specific locations in the middle of nowhere. Literally everything. Every single day, we had to give hourly updates to an internal agency about the status of our drivers. Each load required a team in order to minimize the stopping time. Now stopping for a break would have not been an issue. But these trucks hired by the agency had specific instructions to not stop for more than a half hour throughout the itinerary, nor to open the contents of the trailer. And that last bit had a stern warning attached to it. The location of these trucks was constantly monitored by a GPS coupled with a timer to ensure these conditions were met. Now, this was a routine for a long time and we never got into any sort of trouble. The process was smooth, and with the time-based conditions, the deliveries also happened optimally. We have had many of these contracted loads delivered without any notable issues. However, one day proved to be different. During this day, one of our truckers was stopped by a DOT officer. In case you don't know, DOT stands for the Department of Transportation. It was well within their rights to ask us to stop and inspect our trucks. The officer demanded the drivers to open the trailer so as to reveal the unidentified contents inside. Our drivers clearly cited our contract with our client, stating that we could not open the trailer under any circumstances. However, the officer was persistent and broke the electronic seal himself. Our systems at dispatch were frozen immediately. To the officer's surprise, the trailer contained Tomahawk missiles used by the Department of Defense. Two Apache helicopters were scrambled from the nearest Air Force base, and the DOT officer was taken into custody. He was just doing his duty so later he was released. I think they just made sure that he was an American citizen and won't spill the secret out. Just imagine the driver being an Asian dude. He would have never been seen in public again. So it turns out that the transportation of contents such as these missiles and other military equipment is quite common. Since they are concealed in a dry van, however, the public is completely unsuspecting. It is quite genius to not attract attention. My dad was driving in Albuquerque when he stopped for the night in the parking lot of a pawn shop. It was about 10.30 p.m. and his air compressor was empty. Earlier that night he had rolled down the windows, but since the compressor was out, and he couldn't roll them back up until it refilled. Anyway, he was getting ready for bed and a voice yelled at him to not move a single muscle. A female Latino tweaker jumped into the truck from the driver's side. It is to be noted that the voice was coming from the passenger side window. The other one who jumped from the driver's side pressed a gun to his head, ordering him to give her all his money and valuable belongings. Unfortunately for her, my dad doesn't ever carry cash, and the poor fellow never buys himself anything expensive too. He only had like $50 on him, a broken laptop, and his clothes, blankets, and toiletries. Of course, he did have his debit card and credit card. They held him, hostage, in there for more than an hour, as she unloaded everything from the cab and handed it to her 350-pound black male friends. According to my dad, the girl was tripping balls the entire time. She ordered him to follow her to the ATM, but considering that my dad owns his own business, it probably wouldn't have ended well had she seen his accounts. He decided he couldn't let it happen. After a few more minutes, she decided they were walking to the ATM. She had her friend on the passenger side help her down, ordering my dad to follow. As soon as she was clear of the door, he closed the door, locked it, and tried to honk the horn, but it hardly made any audible noise. Apparently, that noise was loud enough to send the trio running into the darkness with blankets in their hands. Shaken by the sudden course of events, my dad called the police. Surprisingly, they had an amazing response. 
10 to 15 patrol cars, a helicopter, and dogs were there within five minutes. They caught two of them, but not the third one. I would also like to add another story that my dad told me a few years back. My dad drives in Texas a lot, but there is a particular road that he always avoids. I'm not sure what road it is, but he says it's in the middle of an old Native American land. One night as he was driving through, he kept seeing shadows running alongside his trailer. Every once in a while he would hear a loud bang, as if someone was slapping the side of the trailer. He decided to stop and see if a tire has blow, because that was the only thing that could be making that sort of loud noise. He did his usual walk around, checking the tires, but as he turned the corner, he heard a laugh, and a shadow took off running down the road. Needless to say, he jumped in the truck, and didn't stop until daylight. This happened a little over 5 years ago, when I was either 10 or 11 years old. When I was younger, my dad would take either my sister or me, in his 18-wheeler truck across the eastern part of the United States. This was mostly so he didn't have to unload the truck all by himself, because he was a lazy guy. Anyway, I went with him one summer, and we stopped at a Burger King joint to eat and refresh. I am unable to recollect as to where exactly it was but it was either in Kentucky, Virginia, or West Virginia. I nearly got hit in the parking lot by some douche, which was bad enough, but the really creepy shit went down once we were inside. I ordered a kid's meal with a Dr. Pepper. The cashier was this weird, redneck-looking dude. I remember taking a sip of my drink a little after sitting down, and it tasted weird, but I had a mouthful of food at the time, so I didn't pay much attention to it. Now, ordinarily, I will chug down anything carbonated, but for some reason, something told me not to do it this time. After I finished eating, I took another sip and it was definitely not Dr. Pepper. I told my dad that it didn't taste like it. He tasted it, and then went and yelled at the creepy looking redneck cashier. The manager fired him on the spot. I later learned in my teenage years that the flavor was that of very cheap beer. So some creepy redneck, likely a pedophile, tried to get a nine-year-old boy drunk in a Burger King. I am not a trucker by profession, but this is a story about two truckers. My mom and I were headed a few states away to visit my brother. About an hour into our trip, we got a flat tire and had to pull over. I was the driver, and as I didn't want to destroy her rim, so I made it to the exit ramp. The first trucker stopped and helped us change the tire out for the spare. I tried to do it myself, but I had parked on an incline and was struggling. He was very nice, tried to refuse the $30 my mom gave him for the trouble, and suggested we try to buy a patch at Walmart down the road. We were both in need for a cup of coffee at this point, so we stopped at a huddle house before we went to Walmart for the patch. We asked the lady behind the counter if she could give us directions to the nearest Walmart, and in the process heard about the flat. She informed us that her brother-in-law was over in one of the booths, and he would be happy to do the patch for us. Now her brother-in-law is the second trucker. We finished up, and agreed to follow the guy in his 18-wheeler over to the store. When we got there, I decided to stay with the car and my mom's dog, while my mom heads into the store with the dude. When they got back, my mom had a strange look on her face. I looked at her in curiosity, and she responded with the look of I'll tell you later. As he was fixing the tire, he started questioning my mom about my age and relationship status. It was getting creepy because he was asking her stuff as if I was not present there. The creepiest moment happened after that, as he went to get his toolbox out of his rig. Because that was when he opened the door, and an object rolled out and hit the pavement. My mother, being the polite lady she is, started to retrieve it. I knew what it was as soon as my eyes laid upon it. It was a giant, purple dildo of the double-headed variety. As soon as the recognition took place, I threw my arm across my mom to stop her, and furiously shook my head to get her to stop. Eventually, he retrieved it himself. He got the tire back on the car, and attempted to solicit my mom for information about me again. He refused to take cash from her, but requested my number instead. I answered before she could respond with a fake number. 
Luckily, he did not dial to check if it was correct. As we drove away, I had to explain to my mom that she almost grabbed a trucker's purple dildo 